advice from an old guy nearing the end. That's my t t sermon title this morning, and I suppose you're thinking that could be me. <laughs> no. No, nobody's thinking that. Well, I graduated from college and began my first career 56 years ago this year. I have seven grandchildren and one great-grandchild. If, if threescore years and ten is the time allotted to us here on earth, there's no question I'm in overtime. <laughs> so, uh, an old guy, I, well, yes, that would be true, but am I nearing the end? Well, the life expectancy of a Canadian male is 82. And that's not far away anymore. So, no matter how you look at it, I guess I am an old guy nearing the end. But you know what? I'm not the old guy nearing the end that my title refers to this morning. No, no. The old guy nearing the end I'm speaking to you about this morning is the Apostle Paul. And old guy Paul wrote two letters to young guy Timothy. And in the last part of his last letter, that's where we are this morning, it's obvious, it's obvious that Paul is nearing the end because he writes these words, 2 Timothy chapter 4, that's the last chapter of Timothy, verse 6. Here's what he says to Timothy and to us. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. And then he says it. The time of my death is near. And in these last pages of his last letter, he gives Timothy his last advice. Now, maybe advice isn't the best word for what Paul shares with Timothy here. Maybe advice is too weak a word for me to use. When I don't know what you think of when you think of the word advice, but I think of a smiling grandfather sitting in his lazy boy chair dis dispensing kindly suggestions to his grandchildren. Or when I think of advice, I think of a high school guidance counselor offering his, uh, offering his recommendations for future career choices for a student. Well, if that's what advice is, then what Paul offers here in this chapter is, has, is something different. It's something with much more authority. It's something with much more punch, it ha uh, more oomph. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says, I solemnly urge you, in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. That sounds like strong advice. That sounds, this is serious stuff. This is not Paul the Apostle saying, can I offer you some suggestions, Timothy? That's not what he's doing here. Now, Paul's end is near. Maybe that could be better said. The end is near for Paul. These are his, these really are Paul's dying words. Now listen to me this morning. When you're nearing the end and, and you know it, then the words that you speak, I've been there a few times with people who are speaking their last words and they always speak vital words. They speak important words. It's not then that they talk about the weather. It's not then that they talk about the, the dismal showing of the Blue Jays as they exited the playoffs this year. No, sir. Not, not dying words. So Paul is saying, so Timothy, with God as my witness, I charge you with these words. I urge you. I challenge you. Timothy, take heed and hear my words. And that quite describes me as I stand here here this morning, like Paul, I guess I am, an old guy nearing the end. So here is the charge this morning to you from two old guys nearing the end. To you, some of you, like me, are in your senior years. Others of you are in midlife, and some of you are young with a whole lifetime before you, 
But Paul and I have five challenges for you, five of them, and here's the first one. Number one, stand on the Word. And I take you to verse 2 where Paul writes, preach the Word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct rebuke and encourage your people with good teaching. Now, I'm guessing many of you are sitting here today thinking, preach the Word. Well, Pastor John, that would not be me. Well, maybe not in the specific sense that we usually think of the word preach, as in stand before a congregation like this or in front of a classroom teaching, but in the broader sense, Timothy is saying to every one of us that you should stand on the word. Now, Paul doesn't say it here, but of course when he says the word, he means the words of Scripture, he means the words of Jesus, and he means Jesus himself, who is the Word. Stand on the Word. Speak the name Jesus. And over these next weeks, we're going to help you do just that. And Timothy, uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, and you need to speak, you need to stand on the Word and speak it out Say his name in the workplace, at break time, in the community, at the rink, at family gatherings, to your parents, to, in conversations with your children, your grandchildren. In private conversations, Paul is saying, stand on the word, hold it out. There are so many words out there today, words, 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 and more words. Social media grabs the attention of so many and holds it these days and the scary thing for me is that I see so many and some in my own family who form uh, form opinions and life values for what they're picking up on Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or whatever. Not you. Paul is saying not you. Stand on the word. Let it be known where you stand and on what you stand, the Word. Now imagine I go to the doctor for a checkup, and the doctor looks at me and says, uh, John, you're, you're, you're a magnificent physical specimen. Well, I did say imagine. Okay, so. <laughs> he says, John, you have the body of an Olympic athlete. You're using your imagination, aren't you? Yes. But later that day while climbing the stairs, I'm totally out of breath, and I find out later that my arteries are so clogged that I'm just 10 timbits away from a coronary. And so I go back to the doctor and I say, Doctor, what on earth? Why did you not tell me? And the doctor says, Well, I know your, I know your body was in worse shape than... Humpty Dumpty, but if I tell people stuff like that, they get offended, and they won't come back, and, and I want my office to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. And I would say, as you would, I hope, I'd be furious, and I'd say, doctor, when it comes, when it comes to my health, you must tell me the truth. Hear me today. People need to hear the truth like never before verse 2 says whether the in his letter here whether the time is favorable or not the amplified new testament says whether it is convenient or inconvenient whether it be welcome or unwelcome eugene peterson in his own translation called the message says proclaim the message with intensity challenge warn Urge your people, your loved ones, people that you talk to. Billy Graham was probably the 20th century's most prominent Christian voice. And one time he said, because the truth is unpopular does not mean that it should, it does not, mean that it should not be proclaimed. Graham is saying, speak it out, say the word, say the name, say the name Jesus. Verse 2 says, correct, rebuke, encourage. 
My dad pastored 40 years in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and he had very little, formal, very little formal training, but a whole bunch of common sense. And when I was on the front end of my ministry, just a bit over 40 years ago, he said to me, now John, preach some sermons that comfort, comfort the afflicted. That's the encouraging ones that the scripture here refers to. But he says, John, you also need to preach some sermons that afflict the comfortable. And those are the, the correcting, rebuking ones. Hear me today. We can't just speak words that our loved ones like to hear. Stand on the word. Hear me now. When you speak, when, when your words come from the word and includes speaking of the word, and that's Jesus, then your words are more powerful than the words of Premier Higgs or Justin Trudeau or your school teacher, more powerful and more important, or the news coming out of the Middle East or from your college professor or the Department of Health. So Paul's first challenge to us is simply this. Stand on the word. Hold to the truth. Here's number two. Stay with it no matter what. And I take you to verse 3. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. I'm suggesting to you today that, that I'm afraid that time is here. He goes on. They will follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. What I'm saying to you today is that you may stand on the word and some people will, will reject it. And Paul's message to us is stay with it. Just stay with it no matter what. You may say, this is the truth. You may say, this is the truth. And they may say, well, yours may be. But I have my own truth. And what's true for you may not necessarily be true for me. Stay with it no matter what. It's a very different world we live in today than even 50 years ago. Even inside the church today, I hear voices that are following their own desires. I, I come across those with itching ears, those that reject the truth. And I say to you today, stay with it no matter what. You probably have a can of WD-40 around your house somewhere, don't you? I have a pastor friend years ago, he had arthritic elbows and he sprayed it on his elbows. He said, it loosens joints, it'll... he said it worked. You probably have the can, you know it, it's the blue and gold can. Do you know what the WD stands for? That stands for water deplacement. Do you know what the 40 refers to? That's how many times they tried to develop an effective formula. They failed 39 times, but succeeded on the 40th. The message is then from WD-40, is don't give up, don't quit when you are tired, don't quit when you fail, don't quit when you meet obstacles, and don't quit when you get criticized. Don't ever quit. Stay with it, no matter what. Paul writing to the church at Galatia puts it this way, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. May I refer to my dad once more? He had a word that he used to use. I don't hear it much anymore. He'd say, now, now that girl has gumption. Gumption is the ability to decide what is the best thing to do in a particular situation and then to do it with energy and determination. And that's what Paul is saying here. Oh God, give us gracious gobs of gumption. I spent six delightful years over in Sussex at Kingswood University, 2001 to 2007. I say delightful, that's from my perspective, if you talk to some of my students from back then, it might not have been quite so wonderful for them. 
But the not so delightful part of my time there and since is my list of students who dropped out of ministry and dropped out so it would seem, at least, I'm not their judge, only God knows the heart. But it seems that they've dropped out of the church and out of the faith. God alone knows. But the point is this. Many did not stay with it no matter what. Verse 5, Paul continues to make his point. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. So he's telling us it won't be easy, but stay with it. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given, with, given you. Stay with it no matter what. Here's number three of Paul's last words. He says, you need to learn to see more than your eyes can see. You need to see more than your eyes can see. Verse 6, as for me, Paul writes, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Let me ask you something today. Do you eagerly look forward to his appearing? Or is that something you don't want to think about? Verse 18, Paul comes back to this theme. The Lord will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Let me ask you, can you see, can you see what these eyes, your eyes can't see? Let me ask you, has, has the world numbed, numbed you into seeing what lies ahead for the believer into the same imaginary category as Never Never Land or the Land of Oz? Is what God has prepared for you become that nebulous? Has it? Listen to me today. It's real. Oh, it's real. You need to learn to see more than your eyes can see. You know those stretch limos that you see around town now and then gliding by? Windows all dark. You can't see if there's anybody in there, but if they're moving, there must be. And do you, do you know what I discovered? When you get up close, I saw one parked and I thought, I want to see what's in the inside. So I walked up next to the windows and put my nose right next to the windows and I could... I could see what was on the other side. Listen to me. Paul, here, as he writes this stuff, is up close. So am I. And so are some of you. And sometimes I can almost, almost see what's on the other side. Can you see it? One of the most prolific songwriters in the history of Christianity, some of you will know this name, is Fanny Crosby. She wrote over 9,000 gospel songs and hymns. She was blinded in both eyes when she was six weeks of age, so she, has, she had no memory of ever seeing anything, but she could see, yes she could, she could see what eyes can't see. In her hymns, over and over again, she spoke about sight. In her hymn, in the hymn, Blessed Assurance, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Same hymn, watching and waiting, looking above. From her hymn in the cross, near the cross, I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever. And in what I believe is the grandest hymn she ever wrote, to God be the glory, she wrote. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport. When Jesus we see. She saw. She had glimpses of what for us here today is but a hope. 
that magnificent land that's just beyond, just a heartbeat beyond this world, it's real. Listen to me now. If you'll stay with it no matter what, you will need those moments when you can, when now and then, when in Paul's words to the Corinthian church, here's what he wrote, 2 Corinthians 4, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. Doesn't make any sense, does it, or does it? Fix our eyes on something that can't be seen? For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. And what's he talking about? Next verse. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. You see it? You know, sometimes, every once in a while, it, it gets, I feel it so close, I feel homesick. Here's the fourth piece of advice Paul and I have for you today. Here it is. Surround yourself with good friends. Verse 9, Timothy, please come to me as soon as you can. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come. And then at the very end of this letter, he mentions Priscilla and Aquila and Onesphorus and his family, and he mentions several others by name. Interesting enough, he also mentions a couple of not-so-good friends. He mentions a guy named Demas. Verse 10, Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life. And he mentions a guy by the name of Alexander, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him. I believe Paul's point here is you need to surround yourself with good friends. And there's others, from, there's others that for whom you need to be careful. You need to maybe even keep your distance from some Demas or Alexander. I had just graduated high school and I headed off to Teachers College in Fredericton. And in the early days there, I met a guy named Jimmy. He was a good guy. I liked him and we started hanging out. And then one day Jimmy looked at me and said, Simons, you're a goof off. And I'm not going to hang out with you anymore. Because if I do, I'll flunk out of Teachers College. And that was it. And we didn't hang out. I'd see him now and then. And we'd, we were friendly. We'd exchange greeting. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, John, he'd say. Jimmy did very well at Teachers College. He went on to a long career as a teacher. Became the mayor of the small town that he lived in in northern New Brunswick. And guess who flunked out? And ended up taking courses, night courses, and summer school courses. That'd be me. Surround yourself with good friends. I hope that in later years I'm a better friend than I was in those early years. Someone defined a friend as one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. Dr. H.C. Wilson, who has stood often here in this place, in this pulpit and preached, even in late years he has, have been friends for over 70 years. And, though, and through the years, geography has dictated whether we get to hang out much or not. He, for years, he lived down in Indiana. But now I live at Brown's Flat, Beale Campground, and he has a home there. His wife, Gloria, left this world for heaven in June of last year, and I started just dropping by. He was always on my mind and on my heart, so I would drop by. One night... I was there. I'd go several times a week, sometimes only stay a few minutes. And one night he said to me that between 8 and 10 at night, when I'm here all by myself, those are the longest hours of the day. So about quarter of 8 at night, I would say to my wife, well, when do you mind if I go down? So I would go, and 
Oh, those days we did breakfast, we did dinners, we did lunch, we watched hockey games, we toured the county, attended a ball game or two, often listened to music, and we talked and dreamed and laughed and reminisced and wept. And our friendship is deeper and richer than it's ever been, never a misunderstanding, never an angry word, and never once do either one of us think, now I wonder what he meant by that. Never. And Paul's making the point that you need friends like that. Do you have any? You need them. One more. Here's the last piece of advice that Paul and I have for you today. Here it is. You need to remember this. Strength comes from the Word. From the Lord. Strength comes from the Lord. Verse 17, Paul had just been telling about some of his discouraging times and troublesome times. And, and then he says, but the Lord, referring to Jesus Christ, of course, but the Lord stood with me and gave me strength. It was Jesus who said, I will never, I will never leave you. Never. Pastor and author John Ortberg tells this story. He said, I was out surfing one day, and there was no one else around except for a huge guy practicing martial arts on the beach. And after I'd been out a while, a little wisp of a kid came paddling up out of nowhere. I couldn't believe he was out there by himself. He pulled his board up next to me. He was so small, he didn't really need a board. He, he could have stood up in the ocean on a frisbee. And he told me his name was Shane, and he asked me how long I'd been surfing. So I asked him how long he'd been surfing, and he said, seven years. And I said, well, how old are you? And he said, eight. <laughs> we talked a little longer, and then I asked, how did you get here, Shane? And he said, my dad brought me. And then he turned around and waved at the, at the nearly empty beach. And the Goliath doing the martial arts thing waved back. Hi, son, he called out. And then I knew why Shane was so at home in the ocean. It wasn't his size. And it wasn't his skill. It was who was setting on the beach. His father was always watching. His father was very big. Shane wasn't really alone at all. Now you listen to me this morning. Our father is always watching. Our father is very big, very strong. And we are never, never, never alone. So Paul and I, here's, here's our advice. Stand on the word. Stay with it no matter what. Learn to see more than your eyes can see. Surround yourself with good friends. And remember this, your strength comes from an ever-present Lord. Paul lands his, his last, very last words to Timothy are my very last words to you this morning. May the Lord be with your spirit, and may his grace be with you all.